Hello and welcome back to some more College League of Legends. My name is Blue Jay, and as always, I have Armor Class over here with me. How's it going today, Armor Class? It's going pretty good. You know, it's a great Saturday, especially over here in Michigan. The sun is shining, and we are ready for this best of three series, Aquinas versus Northwestern University. We are seeing Aquinas here on red side and Northwestern on blue side here. Yep, as you say, on the sides, we're already getting jumping into pick and ban phase. Udir taken off the table. Kaisa will soon follow for Aquinas, while Northwestern has taken off Ezreal and Lilia. Some of these farming junglers, while the jungle was nerfed and 11.4, are still very prime, like, first picks and, and very, very strong. And they're not quite as powerful um, getting out into some of that mid-game where you don't have quite as much gold, quite as much XP, but you're still hitting those breakpoints early. You're still hitting level 4 off of a full clear, and you still will be stronger than the enemy jungler who's only doing a 3 camp when you're trying to jump out of your jungle. So, not seeing too much change out of that. It's more of the other champions that are rising out of the dust. Sometimes we'll see some J4, or hopefully we'll see an Elise. I still love that champion, but look who it's first picked. Seraphine. We do see the Seraphine here, a pick that can be both played in mid lane and in both roles in bot lane. Uh, I do want to talk about those bans real quick. That Ezreal and Lilia are definitely respect bans towards Obi Toppin and PJR. Uh, whenever you see PJR on that Ezreal, he definitely performs, you know, above what his rank even states. He is a master class ADC, but he is a destructive one at that. Yeah, and. I'm glad that, well, I'm not really glad that banned the Ezreal, but it makes a lot of sense. We've only seen it a few times, but each time, like you're saying, he's been popping off on that pick, and it's one that's been rising with the new Essence Reaver Duskblade build. I say new, but it's been about a month by now, but instead it's going to be the Tristana and Alistar locked in. Now, Tristana can still be used as a flex pick, but I'm fully expecting to go that into the hands of Double Zero here in the bot lane. That's where we see it most often, and we'll see where that Seraphine ends up. I mean, they still have two more picks. You can you know, take your jungler, take your top laner here. Um, you're picking them blind, but I mean, Hecarim is probably the third strongest option in the game after Udyr and Olaf are taken out. Yeah, and I think it's actually a really uh, fascinating and versatile season that we're having right now where we can see these, you know, these support mages and these ADCs that are able to be flexed in other positions and lanes where traditionally we only ever seen them be placed in that bot lane. <clears throat> and we are seeing that the Janna now, so it is possible that we see that Seraphine going mid, or it could be that ADC Seraphine that we talked about a little bit. Uh, double shielding bot lane like that, they're going to be very safe, but they're going to be playing for late game. It looks like they're trying to go all in on this Hecarim, just buff up the jungler, put down those shields, get some healing. And it's honestly, it seems like kind of a coin flip depending on, on what AQ choose to draft. And I really like this J4 pick coming up because that is something that Excuse me, Jonna and Seraphine can't really dissuade, right? You hit that Cataclysm, you knock them up with your flag and drag, and then they're just locked in there with you. There's no way you're getting out. You have no movement abilities. Even if the Jonna uses her ultimate, the Monsoon, it's just going to push them to the edges of the Cataclysm. And to get out of that as well, if she's able to somehow trap that Hecarim, the Hecarim has to use that, you know, that Onslaught of Shadow to get out. And that is a big ultimate that you want to save for those team fights. Yeah, and something about Aquinas here, they've been playing that Jarvan a good bit, and something they've always done well was with is making that Cataclysm into a blender. You know, Stevenator has shown time and time again that he can perform on things like the Orianna. These assists this Jarvan engage so much, and now we have an Alistar. There's just going to be layers of CC that go on in the middle of this Cataclysm, and if something like that Seraphine or Janna gets caught in there, they will be shredded very quickly. AQ, their three members right now, all have the ability to jump in. And so now I'm kind of looking to see if they're going to have a little bit more of a protective control control style mage like that Orianna that I talked about. And I'm really excited to see what their next pick are. And Yeah. And with Fate's Call, he has been playing a bit of that Kennen, and he might even be able to pick out that Nar. Narvin used to be a very lethal combo, and it's going to be the Kennen like we said. Yep, I, I am kind of liking that cannon. It's it's something that has the range crowd control, and which could be pretty useful versus the Janna and, and Seraphine, right? Where, as with Nar, you have to jump into that fight, get in the middle of that, and you can just easily be ulted away, hit that tornado, even maybe charm, where Kenneth can kind of skirt around on the out of the fight there, and then press that slicing Maelstrom, stun some people up. But it is going to be the Nar picked up for the other side, so I'll, I'll give you a point for that one, AC. 
Now, they did ban away on the side of Aquinas. They did ban away Vladimir and Camille. So those are two fairly good counters into pretty much all of AQ's composition. And at this point, I'm still not sure where that Seraphine goes. It looks like it is going to be in the mid lane, and they are just doing completely supportive style. Even the Sivir with that ultimate. You know, you're just getting so much movement speed for this Hecarim, for this Narn to engage onto this fight. And it's fairly safe in the bot lane. You have a lot of wave clear and... You know, there is a little bit of a new build, that new Duskblade build coming out with Sivir. I'm not a huge fan of it. I think you might as well just go more crit and go on hit because you're putting all of your eggs in one basket with that Q. But we'll see what the 14 baller here is going to be choosing to go when we get started into this game. Now, for the side of AQ, you might have noticed that Tommy is not in the game this time. Instead, we do have a substitution of X not a lime for the support player, and it's actually going to be Jinx and the bot lane. I love this. I've been so excited, and I've been wanting to see this forever. Yeah, Kraken Slayer Jinx has definitely been making a rise lately. A very, very destructive ADC that we can see here. Oh, I was going to say, for a second, Fate's Call and PJR00 were not trading, and I know Fate's Call was the original owner for the Jinx club tag, and I was kind of seeing if they were going to play games with us there for a minute. But uh, I do want to talk about compositions here. The Gnar does kind of make this Jarvan a little bit of a double-edged sword. If that Jarvan accidentally ults somewhere near his teammates, they are going to get affected by the Cataclysm followed by the Gnar ultimate. But we're going to have to hope, and we've all seen Obi Toppin, especially with that Volley Bear, he's very good about getting himself into that back line. Agreed, yeah. Obi Toppin has been one of the key players for AQ, which is... Why you see a lot of bans going towards him? Like, we talked about that Lilia, that respect ban, but what it really came down to was the team fighting and, and how he played the Lilia. It wasn't that he was just solo carrying. It was just he was in the right spot. He was where he needed to be, when he needed to be there, and he was just supporting all these other big carries. You know, sometimes he went Moonstone. Sometimes he went, you know, more of the damage Leandre's build. But today, we are going to be seeing him uh, on the Prince of Demacia paired up with the Tristana, Jinx, and Alistar combo in. We'll see if Kennen just chooses to sit in a side lane because he's the Kennen can also be very comfortable just on the outside of the map, pushing down turrets and getting a little bit of a lead. It's it's one of those counters actually into Nar that people was bringing out when Nar was really, really popular because when Nar tries to go in on the Kennen, you just stun him up and run away. And Kennen can pretty much outrange him at most of the early points in the game as, as Nar auto attack, you know, range actually scales um literally just based on his levels so early on he doesn't have that much range to outduel the cannon yeah i i completely agree nar's gonna have to be very careful in this matchup <clears throat> and i am very curious to see how well this the stevenator will be able to perform on this tristana a very aggressive pick Hopefully, we're going to see some early ganks coming out from Obi Toppin and Stevenator here. They're going to have to play very well around that mid lane matchup. Seraphine does not have many movement abilities. She only really has a speed up and a shield, but she can also slow and snare if she's able to. But if they're able to jump in on her, at least burn a flash, they're going to be able to do those repeat ganks. And I really think Obi Toppin's going to have to be playing through Stevenator here. And I think they're actually going to be able to contest these dragons fairly early on. Uh, it takes a while for that Sivir to come online, especially if it is that lethality build that you were talking about. Uh, I definitely think that the crit build, like you were saying earlier, is the much smarter option. Uh, that lethal tempo crit, especially with the bouncing boomerang, it makes it so much easier for those small auto attacks to just slowly weave their way through a team fight. So I'm very curious to see how they're going to play this out right now. They don't really have too much uh, AP damage coming from the side of Northwestern. So it'll be very interesting, because they're all very squishy, but they do have some shields. Yep, they do have that shielding. They have a lot of damage, but I don't actually see a ton of engage, right? It's the Hecarim who has to go all into the fight with the Sever backing up, the Seraphine. I guess you could say the Encore for Seraphine is really one of those huge tools, and something that we don't usually get to see a lot of since it's banned so often. So happy to see that one picked up in the hands of Aredo here. Uh... But, like I was saying, like they're all big ultimate skill shots where the Alistar, the J4, even the Kennen, and somewhat the Jinx has some crowd control that is not based on their ultimate ability. So skirmishing can be a little bit easier for them. They can be a little bit more haywire with their abilities. Just try and catch a few people out, go in and out of some team fights where, as the side of Northwestern, they are an all-in composition. And we'll see how that works out, but we will be taking a short break while we load onto the Rift and set up our clients.
All right, everybody, we are back, and we are now loaded on to the rift here. Again, it is Northwestern University on blue side and Aquinas College here on red side, and this is a best-of-three series for Seelaw. Yep, and as we're jumping through, looks like to be a little bit of a five-point back and forth, nothing too special, but as you were talking about some of those early ganks, it is going to be that Hail of Blades, Tristana, and having that J4 use that flag and drag at level two, or or even maybe level three when that when that Trist hits level two as well, you could just burst the Seraphine. It's going to be Phase Rush Seraphine, and she has some of the lower base stats in the game, like most of these other <laughs> music-based champions like Sona. They just have like no armor, no magic resist, so it's they're very, very squishy, and there's just so much damage coming out of those two members from AQ, and that's kind of the lane I want them to target. Yeah, AQ's kind of got a lot of explosive potential here. If they're able to get ahead, they're looking for those big engage fights, whereas Northwestern is probably going to be looking for the no vision catches throughout the jungle here. We are seeing that is that Dark Harvest Sivir that we were talking about, that lethality build that Blue JI in here kind of warrant against. It's going to be very interesting. We actually are seeing the Conqueror on drinks. I'm kind of surprised. I would have expected more of a lethal tempo build from her. Yeah, a little bit of an odd pickup, but, you know, have, we have some faith in the in the Masters player, AD carry for AQ, but maybe you know some secret tech that we don't. We do see Conqueror for a lot of different AD carries at the moment, too, like, like Aphelios, like Samira. Those other ones that actually want to duel a little bit more, so I'm not totally opposed with it. And, you know, with her attack speed bonuses, um, and that's going to include her her new her new uh, Q, where you don't always lose that tech seed as fast. I'm sure you can, you know, proc that conquer pretty effectively, especially if you're going to be landing some of those zaps and Ws, because you do still get those two points. But is that level two gank in the mid lane? Flash burned for Arado, and kind of have to expect that. I mean, we're talking about it since champ select, and it looks like Arado just didn't really respect the fact that Tristan and J4 can kill you at level two. Yeah, if you look at Obi Toppin's uh, farm score right there, he in fact did just go right for the red buff into that gank, and they did get that flash out, and we're going to hopefully see that return gank here within the next five minutes or so. Stevenator and Obi Toppin still have their flashes. Uh, besides that, I think it's going to be kind of a calm lane state until Obi Toppin does make his return towards that mid lane, or we start maybe seeing these contested scuttles coming up. Yep, and we do see Obi Toppin is going towards that bot side clear, and he could easily come into the bot side as well. It is the Jana Sivir, though, so you can block a little bit of the damage, but Sivir actually doesn't do too well onto Alistar, because you use that spell shield, and it actually only cleanses, you know, one of the two abilities, mostly being that, you know, the, the, the headbutt, right? And then you still get that pulverized knockup into that. Is that the correct order, Ace? You might have played, you might have played, uh... <laughs> Alistar a little bit more is that the headbutt is the the one that goes forward right and yeah. the pulverize really goes up okay cool cool cool, cool. headbutt's the dash and pulverize, pulverize will be the knock up or uh, AOE knock up around you yeah hitting the nail on the head we are seeing a small engage here we do see Hecarim here in the top lane Fate's call is just going to get pushed by the heroic charge from Hecarim and that is going to be first blood going over to be Mamba 24. I'm a little bit behind on you so I'll let you kill that yep was pretty easy right there, just wrapped around that top bush, and not too much to say about it. Like you said, you just get pushed over and just taken down right away by that by that Narn Hecker up. We are seeing a little bit of poke coming out here. PJR, Double Zero, and Not a Lime are pushed into their turret. Uh, they do know that the Hecker was topside there, and we are seeing Obi Toppin kind of playing around right now here. And we are going to see him show himself. The bot lane of Northwestern University is going to spot him out, and he is going to look for the recall now. Nothing too special. Did get, you know, a few of those Krugs and, and got some more pressure. Just helping him push down that bot wave. Um, didn't think they had to worry too much about it because B Mamba was on the top side of the map. He did show for that gank there and hadn't really reset. Now we have Stevenator jumping in onto the Seraphine, but... You know, nice little W is going to keep him topped off, so it's not going to be feeling too bad for Rado at this point. Ooh, we did just see the Hecarim did come mid lane and just get the flash out of Stevenator. So now they're both going to have to be very careful, but Tristana still does have in her kit the rocket jump to get away. The next time that's an issue, and Stevenator is going to jump on in now with that rocket jump and get the explosive charge on and procced, and that is going to be Seraphine having to back. She does have teleport. 
No, you're at a 5.010, right? 5.10? Yep. I think I'm caught up at this point, so no big deal here. Gotcha. Uh, yeah, we just forgot to see it before. That's all right. But yeah, so Stevenator already showing a little bit of bullying potential on the Tristan, and you can expect him to be ahead of CS at most points in the game. Uh, it's going to be the Stinker's Argard first rush for that Seraphine. I think that's a really smart itemization choice. You are going to go against 380 champions, and... It's going to help speed up that Zonya's when you're going to need it. Obviously, we'll see them pick up a Mythic first, either that's Moonstone or could be some, another option. If you want to get more AP damage, it is still possible to pick up the Ludens or the Leandres just for more potential. Now, we do have Obi Toppin here soloing out that Drake. Yeah, we do see Stevenator now walking down as well to help out with the straight clear. Northwestern not going to be able to respond to that as they had members that were still resetting. Stevenator did burn the TP to get back to mid lane to get that pressure. And we do just see Mamba 24 on two wolves. And that is going to be the first strike going over to the side of Aquinas. And the next strike that spawns is going to be Ocean. So we're going to be seeing a, either an Infernal or a Mountain Soul this game. Yeah, the Cloud Drake just going down. Looks like AQ probably just wanted to get that one out of the way. They do have some good early potential, but that's going to be the Gnar right into the wall. Fates Call now trapped on the wrong side of the lane. Not going to bother using that ultimate. He knows he's going to go down, and B Mamba is going to pick up his second kill. Yeah, a little unfortunate here. Fate's Call does have the river rewarded there, but Gnar jumping in, using the Gnar ultimate, followed by the W stun, just keeps Fate's Call against that wall long enough for that Hecarim to run in there and help secure that kill. Again, just a, another easy little gank there for being Mamba is getting very, very ahead. And that's kind of the worst member for AQ that you want to have snowballing because that is going to be the big damage dealer. Everyone else is just support as actually not a Lime has to flash away right there. Double Zero getting very, very low on mana. All summoners up on the side of Northwestern bot lane. No jungle pressure, so I don't really expect them to convert a kill. And look at all that slowing potential coming out from the John of the Tornado as well. And looks like Nalani is going to use that engage. The exhaust comes down for double zero. The teleport coming in from the Nor into the bot lane. They're going to try and secure this one onto double zero, but the leap does not bounce off the Q. Doesn't finish him off either. And double zero walks away. Yeah, kind of a failed play there. Fate's Call now just gets to free push this turret, try to catch back up from those two deaths he's had, get this into turret, try to get a plate, and just get himself back into this game on an equal playing field with this NR. He will probably get some of that uh, turret plate there. It is the, the Hexec alternator, so he's going for that full AP build. We did have the mid laner and jungler on the side of KAQ kind of roaming over to this Rift Herald they decided. Then maybe not quite the time, and Obi Talpin pulling off a little sneaky trick as there was actually the River Shrine over there on that top side of the map. So, Northwestern shouldn't have spotted this one out. They know that Obi Talpin was over to the top side of the map. Possibly if they were able to step onto that ward, but they don't know what's going on right now. And they're not going to have any way of trying to contest this objector as B Mamba is over here on the bot side, again clearing. But the Transform Nar. Is coming through. Fate's Call has just turned him up and able to walk away. That's more of the interaction that we wanted to see. Yeah, for sure there. Fate's Call was able to easily get out of there. We are now seeing Hecarim was roaming bot lane. He got the heroic charge and followed by the onslaught of shadows on to PJR double zero. That's going to be the pulverize that does hit up and the heal does save PJR double zero. And we are going to now see Jans does take out PJR there. And not a lime is just going to try to get revenge for his ADC but will not have any luck there. Now on the top side, we do see another play. That's going to be the flash coming out from Nar and Obi Toppin as well. And that was a Cataclysm dropped previously, but they do not secure the Nar. We are seeing action on almost every side of this game right now. That was the Rift Herald dropped, and that is a lot of gold going on to the plates of Fate's Call and Obi Toppin. Yeah, junglers just trading pressure across the map and... You know, Double Zero did pick up the 150 bounty onto that Hecarim. Gets a pretty good shutdown. It's now 1-1-0 one, one, and zero. as Stevenator is going to go in as well. It's just rooted up there as the explosive charges go down. And you can see Aredo now if that Tigger's arm guard has a few more levels under his belt. Not feeling too shabby on this Seraphine. Having that landing phase much, much nicer as we didn't really see any return ganks onto that you know, mid lane, but that's kind of to be expected. It's, it's very hard for Tristana to set up ganks because of the explosive charge passive, where every time a minion um, is last hit, it will explode around it. So you're most naturally just pushing in these waves. 
So very difficult for a J4 to come back through without some help or, or letting the Seraphine push, which the Seraphine doesn't really do that well. Yeah, and we are seeing pings now coming out from AQ. They are setting up. They have a minute left on this Ocean Drag respawn timer. Uh, yeah, something similar with that. Jinx with her rockets, she's able to push, but unfortunately for Tristana, she's not able to turn that off. So the lane state is always going to be more aggressive for Tristana and pushing into the enemy turret. Uh, it's very rough, especially if you're kind of behind. It kind of messes up the lane state. But we are seeing now some rotation from the AQ bot lane a little deep into the enemy jungle as they get vision. We do have both top laners, don't have teleport, and Nars already rotating towards this dragon. So it is going to be, you know, 4v5 at the moment while Northwestern is rotating over here. Now, AQ did place down some pretty good wards. They're looking for that engage, but that is five members. They don't quite have it up. Looks like Obi-Tobin is actually going to try and go through. Jans flashes away. obi Toppin uses the Cataclysm, but goes down. Multiple ultimates coming out using the Monsoon. But b Mamba is on the wrong side of this fight, or he might be right positioned to get onto double zero. The Fear doesn't connect to double zero, but he doesn't have a flash, just has the heals. Trying to kite away, but what can you do when he's just buffed up by his whole team? Yeah, a little and bit more of kills going over to Northwestern. A little bit of an over aggressive play there. I think Obi Toppin wasn't expecting to have that Nar also there. And there was just so much damage that came out so quickly onto him. He doesn't have that gore drinker yet. And Northwestern was just able to quickly capitalize on the fact that he was the only member that came over that wall. I just felt like there's a little bit of a split of communication there for AQ because Surfer Punk wasn't in the top lane at all for a good few seconds there, and, and Fate Skull needed to be telling his team, like, you gotta watch up, everyone's resetting. It's a very common thing to do for, for most members. <laughs> Looks like B-Mom is gonna just smite away that Gromp here, not gonna be caught out, multiple zaps going down, actually pops the ghost, so small win for AQ. Yeah, they did get that resource out. Hecarim does scale with movement speed very well. Uh, if I remember correctly, it's not... A great bonus of movement speed will give him a good bit of attack damage. And we are now seeing AQ is sieging this bot lane tier 1 turret, but they're going to have to be careful. Hecarim is still near bot side. Not a lime is kind of getting caught out a little bit. Took some abuse there and dropped to 50% HP there. And we are now seeing Mama 24 once again returning to keep an eye on this lane. And he's going to be going for PGR, and that is going to be Silver Ultimate proc. And that's going to be a pulverized miss from Not Alive. The boomerang comes out, dropping both members of the AQ bot lane low. But they are going to be getting out of that one safe. Kind of flashed away, but still very, very low health. And I really like those steel-plated boots coming out from Hecarim now. Flag and Dragon to come over to Surfer Punk, who just hops away. He's going to hit that Meganar very, very soon. Does push him into the wall, and the Slicing Maelstrom doesn't come down. Now he's out of range to get into that fight, so... Well, looks like AQ is just scrambling in this game so far, and it's definitely not over, right? You're only a few hundred gold apart, but AQ is very behind on tempo. It's six to one, and they got that first turret, but I don't think Fate's Call should have been the recipient there. You really need either Steven here or Double Zero to be coming online as the Buster Shot coming through activates, you know, the, the Gale Force, but the Seraphine is able to live away with a flash. Yeah, Seeger's arm guard really putting in work right now. A great deal of armor, and that is going to be Seraphine's teleport coming out. <coughs> we are seeing Kennen rotated down here to mid lane, as we do see B-Mama24 running in right now. That's a heroic charge onto Kennen, and he's going to be stunned up. That is going to be Encore coming out. It does charm Fate's call, and that is going to be the Slicing Maelstrom dropped, but that is going to be nothing. The Jinx Rocket does land on Seraphine, but just leaves her above 100 HP. Just not enough damage coming out from that Jinx. You can see the rockets just really tickle people in the bot lane before. And once you pick up a few items, Jinx becomes very, very deadly. Same for Tristana. I think Tristana has a, a little bit of a better curve because she can be very, very strong early. Um, but you have to be really patient with those rocket jumps and not just, you know, running it down. We've seen that a few times at different levels of play. Yeah, but I mean, you really need these double AD carries online. And I really wanted to see that gold go over to someone like Double Zero who... It's going to be pulling a lot of the weight in these team fights when you get down to it. And you really need at least one of these AD carries uh, to be strong at this point. Because like I said, like they don't have a lot of engage. So if Double Zero and Stevenator are on opposite sides of a team fight, well, the Hecarim can't jump on both of them, right? You can't shoot that Seraphine ultimate, that Encore, onto both members. And if you just have one AD carry, that's just going to be bursting down the rest of them. It can go a long ways. Now, Obi Toppin is setting up for a gank here. The Tornado does go wide. So that's going to be one less tool in the hands of Northwestern. But B-Mamba is here as well. He's just 
running right through. They're trying to go on. They haven't spotted Obi Toppin yet until the ward goes down. The knockout misses onto B Mamba. The monster is still available. Onslaught of Shadows comes all the way through the team, and Double Zero will go down. Teleport's coming on the wrong side of the map. I don't know who Fate Skull's going to be wanting to be in the middle of this. It's not a line. It's going to be pushed back, and that's a double kill for the Hecarim. Yeah, I think that was kind of a, a misplay there. Fate's call very, very late on the response TP there. And that is going to be a bunch of members of AQ dropping. And we have Suvenator here under turret. He does get dropped, but he has the Gale Force to get him away. Hecarim almost dropped low, but the rocket jump reset does save him so far right now from the Gnar. As we now run under turret, and Obi Toppin does pick up the Hecarim there. And now Obi Toppin has to be very careful. He's stuck between a Nar and a Janna, and he is going to get dropped by Sivir under the turret. That'll be the Dust Blade and the Dark Harvest proc right there. Man, Northwestern just running over this game. Quite literally, with all those champions. Like this Hecarim 5, 2, and 4 being very aggressive, getting in the face of AQ, and just having the backup from the Seraphine, from the Janna and Sivir, and the Nar at different points. It just feels like. AQ just doesn't quite have their game plan just yet. It's kind of the first game, so hopefully we'll see them bounce back in this. They're not too far behind in terms of gold, but just the raw advantages that Northwestern have at this point is a little difficult for AQ to handle, it seems like. I think they really just need to wait to get some of these item spikes because they were fighting when they only had Noon Quivers on those AD carries, right? That Jinx didn't have any... Now they're going for this Drake, but... The rest of the team's not even here. Your jungler's not even there. They're getting the reset in. Double zero, not a line, are the focus of this. Encore coming down onto three members, getting rooted up. Now, Stevenator jumps to the back of the fight, trying to figure out a route. Obi Toppin comes down with the Cataclysm. The Slicing Maelstrom is soon to follow. Obi Toppin's going to take down the Seraphine, but a big Gnar coming in clutch as the Hecarim is going to get a double kill. Stevenator tries to take it back. Double zero, the last one alive, going through these rockets, but the Onslaught of Shadow's going to find him. And Jonas going to pick up that kill now. 15-5 to 5 for Northwestern. And they're going to pick up this Drake on the back of it all. Yeah, Northwestern here does pick up the ace against AQ. And they are going to be able to probably get more gold off of this. They still have every single turret up on the side of AQ. And I was going to talk about this earlier. The gold value was almost neck and neck even when the kills were 10 and 2. But now that they're going to be able to push these turrets that are still up from AQ right there. So we're taking the bot lane turret. Now the gold lead extended to 2.3 thousand gold. And I think Northwestern is just going to be running away with this mid game for now. They're initiating these fights very well. And AQ is kind of being caught with, you know, with their shoelaces untied. And if we, if you change to the gold over, you can see that this Sivir... You know, 2,000 up on gold against the convoy of double zero just being the recipient of Val. Aredo is now going to be the recipient of all of this damage going onto the top lane, but Stevenator getting that shutdown on the Sivir. The ultimate goes wide from double zero trying to get the Seraphine, but you know what? That's not too bad. You are getting that shutdown. I was just talking about how Sivir is such a large portion of this game, and Stevenator might be the way back in. Yeah, Steven here in the past, we have seen him become that 1v5 carry potential player, especially on things like that Orianna. Tristana definitely has the hyper carry potential, especially with these very squishy champions that we are seeing on the side of Northwestern. If he's able to just keep playing Leapfrog with their health bars, it will be a very good turnaround. AQ almost was able to execute how they wanted their game plan to be during that dragon fight. And we are seeing a little bit of poke coming out onto PJR there from Surfer Punk. They're going to have to be very, very careful. PJR is not exactly what I would call strong. And we did see the Storm Razor pickup coming from Tristana. Very, see, very interesting poke, game but, state. But that Nard did half of that drink's health with just like a Q and, and a few autos right there. So this Nard is very, very strong. And we don't want to discount that 3, 1, and 8 has done a lot for the team. I think it's been a great job using some of those teleports effectively and getting a few kills on the Fates Call with Beam Bomb Ball on that Hecarim, just picking him out. Now, Fates Call on the other end of this fight looks like Obi Toppin and not a line are fainting themselves a little bit of vision control. Thought they might be trying to go in on some of these champions, but like I said, I think they just need to just wait and scale up at, at this point. It's going to be at least another 10 minutes. Well, not really. It's going to be, you know, 7 minutes until you know, uh, the, that soul comes through. So they, they have a little bit of time. Just 
weight on the back of Steven Hater here. He's your strongest member. You talked about that Storm Razor coming in. Um, it is the Gale Force instead of some of the Kraken Slayer that we sometimes see, but she should be go picking up that Infinity Edge and have so much damage on this Tristana to be able to carry some of these team fights. You can see him rocket jumping all around that fight, getting a few shutdowns, uh, doing so much damage. And at the end of that all, Northwestern really only had a quarter health on, on those last three members, even less than most of them. So these fights are still close. I think AQ just needs to be a little bit more patient with what they're doing. Yeah, that gold graph is, it's its very close. There's no clear advantage right now besides the 1,000 gold that you see from Northwestern. But even a 1,000 gold, it's possible that doesn't make the difference, especially with Stevenator. You saw him in that dragon fight. He jumped over the team and went and took out Nar as fast as he could so he couldn't become that disrupting force against the team. They lost the fight, but Stevenator made sure to keep it close. And that's what we're looking for right now is close. AQ is trying to close the gap. They're keeping their tempo up right now. And we did see them earlier. They do have vision into the top side here of B Mamba's jungle. And right now we are seeing the five members of AQ gather as there is now one minute, 10 seconds left on this infernal Drake. We talked about how if things go the way of Northwestern, it's still going to be about six, seven minutes until they even get to that soul point. AQ needs to uh, exercise patience here and show, you know, look through that window to find where can they get into the game and through the driver's seat here. They need to work with Steven Air on this, Tristan. I've been saying it time and time again. Beating you over the head with an AC, you're probably getting a little tired of it by now, but it's not just, you know, that they need to, to wait for it. They need to have all their members there. That's part of being the patience. I think they've been going, you know, one by one or two by two into some of these team fights where the other side has always been grouped as five when it comes to these Drakes, right? We talked about Obi Toppin going in at the very beginning of the match over that wall and there's just all five members just waiting for him they were able to turn that around and you had double zero and not alliance starting that drake there earlier and again they just those two of them got cut up they weren't there now aq is going to hit that reset it's 10 seconds so this drake spawns they're going to be in the right position but northwestern has the leeway onto this drake they don't quite have the vision of b mamba here sitting in this bush not lion hasn't spawned obi toppin is going to find him that onslaught of shadows could come through pretty effectively just waiting that nar bar is very very big the encore comes through it's going to be flashed away from but the nar goes down double zero has taken him out the onslaught of Slider goes back down onto the back line but a shutdown for stevenator make that a double kill he's looking for a triple onto Arredo. he's going to pick that up he's going to get that rocket jump resum and now it's just john's the last one alive and they found the fight ac they're gonna take him down with an ace that is exactly the kind of play we were looking for coming out of aquinas right there they were able to exercise that caution threw down some preemptive traps there from pgr double zero and they were able to take the gnar out before he could make use of that ultimate and aq is now going to charge for that baron and they are leading now with that 2.3k gold lead and i think that was just a well executed play that was a Perfect fight for AQ. Five for zero on the side of AQ. They didn't lose a single member. And now this Baron will go down by the teleport coming out from the Seraphine. This Baron is down to 3,000 health. That Hecarim is so far away. Can they steal it? Probably not. They're going to try and get that reset, however. They have a few members going very, very low. Oh, not a line. Even gets the Hex Flash over the wall, so they don't even lose a single soul here on the side from AQ. And it was, like you said, just one of those perfect fights. It's exactly what you needed. You need to have your Tristana. You need to have your Jinx on the back line of that fight and just have not a line. And Obi Toppin and Fates call it different levels for these team fights. And they just shredded that Gnar. He was gone in an instant. And even that Hecarim, it was so late by the time he chose to engage, he just got popped like a balloon. Yeah, he dropped very quickly. It's not a very tanky horse right now. It did have the Trinity Force. I don't believe they had the Sterix Gauge yet on line. But it does not matter when that Alistar is able to go in and just take a large percentage when it comes to that damage. Just a huge massive number of damage reduction. And we're now seeing four members of AQ. They are pushing down this mid lane with the Baron empowered minions as Fate's Call is topside right now and does have the teleport. And this could be a little bit of results based analysis here. Uh, so bear with me to, to, to fans in AC. But this is kind of one of the reasons I don't really like Lethality Sivir. 
because your all of your damage is just on that Q ability. You throw that out, and then your auto attacks are so slow, and they don't do quite enough damage as compared to a crit from you know from a Kraken Slayer, from a Gale Force, or, or even that Essence Reaver. You get that bonus damage where maybe if you have that crit damage, you bounce it across that fight, and you crit you know Double Zero and and, and Stevenator for half of their health with just you know, two bounces, right? But he doesn't have that with this Lethality build. He gets maybe one auto across, and if he wasn't in range to throw that boomerang out, he's doing no damage to that backline. Yeah, we do see the members of AQ here are sieging the top side inhibitor turret right now. While we top in to throw the flag to spot out B Mamba 24 here. And we're now seeing the rotation back towards mid lane, and they're just trying to crack open the base through whatever avenue they can, or at least for the Baron buff, try to break through these tier two turrets and get more gold into their pockets. Yep, they should really be taking out some of these standing gold. I think they AQ might be a little bit trapped here. They're going on to Stevenade here, that Sivir ultimate pop. Encore comes down as well, but isn't going to find a single member on the side of AQ. And back to what I was saying, they might want to just try and take some of that standing gold. Um, you have multiple towers, you know, like that bot side, like this mid lane inhibitor. And this is what I want to see, where they're splitting up members, having four, and then one member, uh, the Stevenator, onto the other side of the map. They don't really need to pressure this turret. They just need to sit on this cannon mem. Northwestern's composition has to be grouped 100% as five members. Nara's the only one that can really split off into these fights, but he can't match the Tristana. No one can match the Tristana at this point, so just let her burn these towers as B-Mom is looking for double zero. Onslaught of Shadows coming through, getting pushed to the side. That fear lasted forever. He's going to be found out. Going to use the heal, but the shutdown goes over to B-Mamba anyway. Yeah, a little unfortunate there. The members of AQ did get their recalls off, except for PJR double zero did get caught out there, and that money is going to be going over to the member we're expecting to kind of pick up for... Northwestern University, kind of the driving force here for their team, and they are now going to be sieging this tier one mid lane turret, and they're going to be taking it. They do take down that mid lane turret. Their second tier is almost down, but this Drake spawns in 45 seconds, so we'll see if AQ can pull out another team fight win because that's what it's going to take. Before, I think B Mamba was a little bit too caught out, and AQ got a little bit lucky, and all they played the rest of the fight excellently. I don't think they would have gotten such a large burst damage if B Mamba wasn't just sitting there in the bush and just <laughs> right in range of everybody. So we'll see what they do this time. They need to get the resets. They already have that vision line down. You can see they have those three wards all the way across the map, so they should spot Northwestern coming over here. Double Zero just lagging a little bit behind of the team, and they still need to be careful because there's such long range engage coming out from northwestern as fate is actually going to be rooted up here just going to use that lightning wrist to just charge away will be top and using the flag and drag out they are going to be finding some of these wards they're starting up this drake but they need to pull it out of this pit they need to get out of here fate's call at half health double zero is a little bit too close to this front line alistar needs to be zoning this event that narbar is red and he is transforming very very soon has the flash we need to watch that megagnar coming through encore all these abilities are up that drake's down to half health. This is so tense. You can fate's call on the outside. Trying to maybe pull off some of these flanks, but they're just going to be standing right in front. Obi Tom's going to have to go for the seal. The Nar goes in. Encore comes out, but holy crap. Cataclysm comes through all of those members. Slicing Maelstrom comes through with the Zanya. Steven here on the other side of the fight is able to take down the Nar. Jinx is able to pick up a second one, and Obi Tom picks up the third. And AQ with a huge team fight win. Yeah, they did sacrifice the Infernal Drake there, putting Northwestern on to Soul Point. But Soul Point does not matter if you don't have a base to keep it with. AQ now four members strong, adding Fate Skull here to make five. And they are pushing to knock down this bot lane inhibitor. It was perfect. You could see if Obi Toppin is able to get that Cataclysm out, it doesn't matter if the Monsoon and the Encore comes through because nobody's going anywhere. They're all trapped inside. Obi Toppin tried to get a little aggressive on this turret. He might be taken down, got very, very low, but AQ sights are on the Nexus and they will take game one in this best of three series. Very quick transition to an end there. Fantastic team fight performances coming out at those Dragons from AQ. Very, very well done ending transition there. Wow, what <laughs> what a close game. We talked about the gold being neck and neck, and Northwestern just felt like they were so far ahead just winning these fights left and right, but AQ was able to pull it together in the end. But it's not over yet, AC. We still have two more games to come. 
Yeah, like we said, this is a best of three series for C-Lol, and we will be right back as we do set up our next game. Thank you. Hello, everybody, and welcome back. We are in Champion Select here for Game 2 of Aquinas versus Northwestern University. It is me, AC, and I'm here once again with Blue Jay. Welcome back, everybody. Thank you for having me, AC. As always, AC has been doing a great job of managing some of these streaming and casting with me. So thank you very much for, for setting some of this up. Uh, thank you for to Adam and Tor as well for, for getting out some of these esports events. But we're going to jump right in. We have Yone and Camille banned away from AQ over here. And Ezreal and Lilia. So keeping up some of the same bands over here for both sides. Yeah, we are seeing that same respect. AQ this time does have the priority first pick. They are blue side. They are leaving open the Kaisa this time and taking away the Udir. I'm kind of curious to see if Northwestern will take away that Kaisa. And they actually get rid of the Seraphine now. Kaisa open. She's a very, very strong ADC at the moment. And they are going to be hovering right now for Fate's Call. And they're going to be picking it up. Yeah, they do pick up that Kaisa. It was... Wondering if they want to choose that Olaf or maybe that Hecarim instead. Obi Toppin is very, very good at those two picks. Uh, maybe not feeling too great on them right now. Wants to get a little bit more of that counter in. While as Kaisa doesn't really have a counter in that laning phase, right? Can be very, very safe and transitions throughout the game phenomenally. And while doesn't scale quite as well as she used to when she was first released, still see her just popping off in these team fights, and it's gonna be the Senna. Over here for the side of Northwestern. 
Yeah, Senna really good right now. She's able to have her Q. It applies on hit effects, and with that Kraken Slayer, she's able to deal out that true damage very quickly, and she can go very well when paired with something like a Rel, like a Leona. It's actually going to be the Olaf here for B Mamba 24. We are right now just seeing a good sustain and run at you style coming from uh, Northwestern University once again, kind of akin to how they had that Hecarim and things like the Seraphine pick. And I'm very curious to see what AQ is going to do. Obi Toppin could whip out the Jarvan for once again, and they're going to be hovering the Graves instead. Very interesting. Yeah, I wouldn't have been opposed to the J4. Does really good into the Olaf. Um, I uh, saw it in, you know, the, the LCS the other day. We see J4 versus Olaf all the time. And I do like this Senna Olaf combo going over to Northwestern side because I think that was something that was more innovative. Um, people were picking this Senna to, to go over top of this Olaf, right? You can do the healing. You can do some of the shielding with that ultimate onto the Olaf while he gets into the back of the fight. And then later on, when Senna picks up the Kraken Slayer, the Gwyn Sues, be feeling very, very good for them, and you just switch carries halfway through the game. Um, but it's going to be Rakan over here for not a lime on the support. So another engage play making champion, but it's going to give him a little more leeway. He can go in and out with that battle dance, the grand entrance, and the quickness has all these tools to go all the way around these team fights. And maybe some of those those healings and shields would be really good versus that Olaf where. You can't CC him, but you can kind of stop some of that damage from coming through. Yeah, I think Northwestern here is actually kind of uh, having a little bit of PTSD. They pick up that Vagar. That cage makes engages very hard to complete. And if you're facing a team like AQ, you're definitely afraid of them being able to go in on you with such ferocity. So I think the Vagar here is actually a, kind of a smart pickup if they're a little worried about that playstyle again. It is somewhat of a neutralizing lane, right? If if Stevenator wanted to play something that's going to want to fight and get in the face of a mid laner, Vekor is very, very good at just dissuading that mindset. Because like you talk about, he just throws down that cage. You get, you get stunned up. It's such a huge area of effect. You can't go in and out of it when you're trapped inside. And not only is it good in that laning phase, but it's good against the Rakan, good against the Grey, it's good against the Kai'Sa. Because that Kai'Sa can't use the killer instinct over the cage, right? If you just throw that cage down and the Kai'Sa, oh, like, oh, I want to jump onto that Vagar, and you travel through that area of effect, you get stunned up. And you're pretty much dead at that point. <laughs> that lane in the game when the Vagar can just press Q and you die, right? Or maybe R. And that is going to be a lot of top lane bans. You know, we have the Kennen, Aatrox, and Nar, and Vladimir taken away from both sides, respectively. Yeah, Northwestern does pick up the Shen here. Kind of a well-rounded comp. Shen works very well in parallel with this Olaf, able to ult in the Stan United while the Olaf is running in to give him a little backup. And we are going to be seeing the Malphite locked in this time for Fate's Call. He's going to be kind of careful. Shen does have his Q, which allows him to pull a sword through an enemy and deal a good bit of magic damage. And we are going to be seeing the Swain once again picked up for Steven Air. Last time we saw it, he was a destructive player in that match. I really like Swain coming out. On the side for Steven Nader, it's very good in the Vagar. Well, however, it might be one of those support picks. So it is going to be that Oriana being hovered. And actually, I don't really mind that having a Vagar support. Again, it's one of, one of those AoE just control supports. And the big problem I have for Northwestern yet again is they're putting all of their eggs into one basket. It's going to be B Mamba as the main carry for Northwestern. You have to expect him to want that early game lead, have that Orianna, the, the Senna healing, shielding, and even the Vagar for some of that zone control. And that Shen ultimate, Stan United going across the map, probably out of the Olaf when he gets low. So it can work out, but AQ has drafted a lot of tools to deal with it. We talked about the Rakan already. You talked about that Swain, and once you hit that Demonic Ascension, you just start healing up from all that damage. You could pick up Azania. not going to be taking any yourselves. And the Graves is so hard to chase down with that phase rush and just kiting with that grit being stacked, those quick draws. It's going to be very difficult to lock on to AQ's members. Yeah, and not to, uh, not to make a pun out of this, but with that Malphite as a cherry on top, AQ kind of has a rock-solid team, if I can say so. No, exactly. And at any point, they could just flip a fight on its head. That Malphite uses that ultimate and just hits one of those backline members like that Vagar. 
then an Orianna and he literally cannot be stopped. Say you have that, that Shen on that Olaf onto the back line. Well, guess what? Killer Instinct comes all the way through. Rakan just dances all the way to the back of that team fight. Graves and Steven Air can stay on that other side. They can deal with the Olaf with all that shielding and stuff. Once you pick up that Sonya, the Graves can kite in and out of these fights. And if you take down those three members and you're only able to take down one on AQ side, you're definitely winning that team fight since a lot of that damage is going to be front loaded for Northwestern. Yeah, and if if AQ is getting into that back line like they would want to with that Rakan, with that Malphite, that is a lot of CC coming out, and they're going to be able to burst down something squishy like the Vagar, like the Senna, and even the Orianna if she's not able to react fast enough. If Olaf and Shen are without a team, it is going to be a very, very difficult end of fight for them to go through. Yes, it is, and one small fast... I'd like to talk about is the scaling coming out from Northwestern because they have the literal, you know, unlimited scaling coming out from Seta and from Vagar. You're both stacking up those souls, stacking up cues from the Vagar. If he transitioned over here, I'd actually really like to see um, some of that support Senna style, have that Vagar take up some of that farm, get a lead early on that Vagar, get that gold, get that ability power, um, and just get, like I said, just, just more stacks on that, that, Q and, and just start running over that game because Senna's going to transition regardless. Curious if it comes out here. I think that's what most players are running at this point. We'll see if Northwestern has, has changed the strategy yet again. Yeah, for sure. Um, I think that we're going to probably be seeing some early activity from Olaf. Uh, I think that with that cage and the Senna snare, Olaf's going to be kind of looking bot lane. They're going to have to be very careful. If that Kaisa and Rakan get ahead even a little, they saw it last game, uh, what that Alistar and what that Jinx could do. I think they're going to have to be very, very cautious when it comes to this game. Again, everybody, this is game two of Aquinas versus Northwestern University. AQ leads the series 1-0 to zero in this best of three matchup. How do you think these uh these dragons are going to start looking for this early game here, Blue Jay? Uh, I think, honestly, I think Northwestern has a lot of early game control. I mean, you talked about the Olaf looking bot lane. Senna and Vigar can push this lane very, very effectively. Rakan doesn't really have anything he can do to help push that wave, right? He is more of an engage and shielding champion. So he's really just, just waiting on the, the Kai'Sa and the rest of these team fights. That's why you really see him picked up and... Only when, when he's really a big threat in the laning phase is when he's paired up with the Zaya, right? And we're not going to see that one today, so no Lover's Duel in the bot lane. Maybe uh, not a Lion and, and Double Zero are, are newly acquainted here as we had Tommy mostly before, but still doing fairly well. I think you can see uh, not a Lion kind of struggling there. He took a little bit too much turret aggro. He might have been pushed up a little bit, um, but not to discount some of those ganking opportunities because I think B Mamba... Um, actually played those ganks very, very well early on, um, being able to discount to that head foot pulverized combo. Uh, but yeah, looking to see Northwestern run the game early and AQ to bounce back late as we're just going to be taking a second to prep the stream. Yep, we'll be right back, everybody. Hello and welcome back to Summoner's Rift for Game 2 of Aquinas Esports Forces Northwestern University. Northwestern is on the red side this game. We'll see if there's any cheeky plays coming out here at level 1. Looks like AQ is going to go for it here going around to the top side. We did see this, you know, when Sevenir picks up that Swain. is very, very good at catching people out um, with that E. We'll see if Surfer Punk can do anything here if they're going to spot this one out. Yeah, AQ going for the full five. They do have the Swain here. If they can land any form of CC and get the pull, that's going to be Shen starting the taunt dash to get away. Yep. So in most other matchups, you might be a little concerned, right? Because you're not going to have that Q, you're not going to have that trading power. Um, but it's a Malphite. It's just going to be two big boys just whacking each other. It's going to take, you know, 30 years to take them down. 
Now, Northwestern did respond with a little bit of an invade of their own once they spot that one out. They're going to put a ward over here, trying to see OB top when he transitions over from this red buff. We'll see which side he starts. So, no big deal coming back and forth. I think it keeps being a little bit <laughs> risky coming in through this way. Not knowing where Northwestern was, but it's not going to pay too dearly. All right, so AC is going to be taking care of a little bit of business, and it looks like it's just going to be a bot lane start here for both junglers. Pretty common for both of these. They really just want to take their time, get some farm. We'll see if Obi Toppin chooses to skip his Krugs. It's pretty common so far. We won't know it until he does it. But yeah, it's going to be Arcane Comet for the top lane on this Malphite. Pretty simple stuff. It is mostly for that lane phase. Sometimes you'll see, you know, grass into these melee versus melee matchups, but... Fate's Call is highly prioritizing this laning phase, getting more damage down onto the Shen, who may not be able to sustain as heavily. And like we were talking about, it is going to be Jans here going for support. Senna does have that Spectral Sickle here into the bot lane, so we're going to see uh, the 14 baller picking up some of this farm, stacking that Q. Really like this adaptation. We'll see if it pays off later into the game. Yeah, definitely. He's going to be able to get those Q stacks that Vagar needs to get that early game ability power to try to get ahead and scale a little bit farther than most mages that he does encounter when it comes to his matchups in mid lane here he does get ability power for hitting enemy champions with each of his abilities but his main focus for that growth is going to be last hitting minions with that q but we are going to have to see if he's able to keep up right now they are putting pressure onto the bot lane of northwestern university here pjr and not a lime are able to just shove a little bit they did have that ward up in top side there by the chickens i believe they spotted out the olaf he did take it and right now olaf is top side and i think aq is kind of feeling really safe right now in the spot lane yep feeling pretty comfortable in this matchup the cs is a little bit it's going to be even up a little bit here for the bot side the vagar is going to pick up some of that it's the ignite vagar with the arcane comet so even though it's going to be support, Santa is still going to be picking up that heal. Don't mind that too much. You know, it's it's not going to amount to too much here. Steven and Aaron just trading back and forth. And Oriana has kind of been very underrated, I think, for, for some of these mid laners. Yes, we get to see those flashy plays coming out from Yone. That support style coming out from Seraphine. But Oriana just feels like she can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with any other mid laner in the game right now. So I'd like to see that one picked up a little bit more. I think Aredo is going to be feeling pretty comfortable in this matchup. Yeah, not only is she able to slow down enemies, but she can speed boost herself, give herself a shield, and give herself basic stats like the armor and magic resist. That's actually going to be Stevenator. He does have to blow the ghost right here in mid lane. Yep, so they're actually going to find Olaf here in this, but the axe does land. We'll see if they can pick up B-Mamba, who's using to flash over here, but Obi Top is going to pick up first blood. Flashes over onto Aredo, trying to secure that one. Does burn the flash, so in the end, four flashes down. Yeah, <laughs> Flashes for each member here, both of the mid lane and jungle variety. Uh, Obi Toppin get, did get a little aggressive there. I think he was hoping he could get a little more there, but Steve Nader just did not have the mana for it. We are kind of seeing a back and forth trade here in the top lane. Yeah, Fate Skull seems to be winning out on that a bit. You can see he, he got that E second there early on, and so... Whenever Surfer Punk is stepping up, Fate Skull just presses E, reduces his attack speed. Like you can see, he kind of missed that one. A little bit of a caster curse on that for Fate Skull. Apologize for you, Fate. But doesn't feel too bad because Surfer Punk can't trade as effectively with those Qs when he attacks so slowly. Yeah, when it comes to Shen, especially early game right now, he's not exactly the most versatile champion until he gets some of those items online and does get that attack speed scaled up his scalings for health and attack speed are actually pretty good considered or uh, compared to some of the others laners here but we are seeing olaf coming through the tri brush here aquinas does have to be very careful and we are seeing the undertow come through and the cage does not catch any member of aq here do spot him out with a ward Oh yeah, sorry, they did kind of, were a little too far away for that as the never move doesn't land on Sororado, hits level 6, so he's going to be feeling pretty comfortable. Obi Toppin did take a little bit of XP from the mid laner, and 
I think that is a really cool interaction you saw from the bot lane. Jans is just using, you know, Curse of the Black Mist with the 14 baller. And there you can't tell uh, what he's doing. If, if maybe you have that Vagar moving in stealthily and then places that cage right on top of people before they even know he's there, that could come out pretty well. It's not a line. It's going to be stunned up. Has that W down from that Vagar and a big chunk of damage going through. Yeah, that's kind of the combo that they're going to be looking for. They're going to see if they can catch some of these members of AQ in that Vagar box just to try to poke them out as much as they can. And they're able to play super safe with these picks like Senna, like the Orianna. That box is going to be such a strong team fighting tool for them as we start getting closer to these objectives like the Dragon. Obi Toppin now hovering around the top side of the map, but... Surfer Punk's been pretty comfortable. He just placed a ward in a spot that went up. But let's talk about these level 6 marks, right? Because now this Shen has unlocked Stand United. So any play that's going on across the map that Malphite can't interrupt. Speaking of plays, Aredo's going to be the recipient of one here. Phase Rush procs for both members. Obi Top, I'm going to trace him through the river. But like I talked about, Stand United coming through and Aredo's going to be walking away. But that is a huge tool that Northwestern had to burn right there. Shen now walking. He did teleport back into lane to try to get some of this pressure here. If AQ does look for this dragon, they're going to be without a top laner for the side of Northwestern. His face call still has his teleport. I'm curious there. Is, is the call for Northwestern then to move your Orianna and Shen down to that river to try and go for it? However, it looks like there be a little scuffle on the bot side of the map. Not amounting to too much besides lane pressure. Now AQ is moving into the river, maybe getting some more vision. Trying to take away that rift scuttle and have that little shrine of movement speed for that ocean drake. And, you know, the point that I was trying to make is, all right, so the Shen doesn't have his ultimate, doesn't have that teleport. Maybe you just go into the river, try and fight out that 5v5. That Malphite's going to have to burn TP and you lose. Yes, you're going to lose some turret plates, but in the end, you might pick up that drake. Instead, it's going to be the safe play for both sides. Drake's not even going to be targeted. Yeah, bot lane now for AQ is resetting here. Simulator did just come back from his own reset. We see Fate's Call also getting his reset off. And bot lane's kind of staying right now. They're going to have to be kind of careful. We do see the never move land onto Aredo here. He does have the blue buff. But Stevenator does get a good bit of poke out onto Aredo there in this lane matchup. Olaf is hovering right now in the Scuttle Bug respawn region going back into his jungle. As we do see Obi Top in here running through with Sweeper to clear out some of Northwestern's vision. Good reset coming through. Has the Noon Quiver already, so going to be picking up maybe some boots and a little bit more AD. Double zero, however, in the bot lane. It's getting very, very low on mana, but 14 baller is as well, so I think they're both trying to be a little bit more conservative. Looks like we're going to be taking a while before we see any five on five action. The Drake is not being targeted at all, and we're already nine minutes into the game. So if one of these teams wants to go for a soul condition, it's going to be very, very late into the game. We're looking, you know, at 30 minutes plus, and that's if someone can stack all four Drakes all at one time, which somewhat unlock unlikely given the composition of these teams. Yeah, not only that, there is still always the wild card steals that can happen. You know, some people think they are low chances, but a steal can still happen no matter the difference in smite level here. I am kind of surprised that they haven't been making any plays. I think both teams are a little wary right now on pulling the trigger in these fights. They're kind of testing the waters right now, seeing if they can maybe get the advantage on the other team just even a little bit more. As we do see, Mamba 24 does kind of spot out Fate's Call here as he is on top of a control ward. We now see Nada Lime did get his own control ward out onto this dragon. We're seeing That's three members be... moving on to Mamba here. That is the Ragnarok proc'd right away. He's going to be backed wow. off, and that is a poked off Olaf. <laughs> yeah, Fate's Call just chipping down Mamba. That should allow them to go for any of these objectives. It looks like Rift Herald is going to be the target here. I like that move. You want more gold. Both sides want to scale up. You have the Graves. The Malphite scales pretty well it, itself, just getting more armor and, and, and just tanky stats. And the trade is going to be for B Mamba and Jans to take over this Drake. Now, they are in a ward. We'll see if they want to switch over. And they're going to. They might be a little bit too late to get here, but they might win the fight and transition over. Steven Eater finding Aredo. Pops the Ghost and the Demonic Ascension. The Shen ultimate comes through. The dragon goes over to northwest, and we'll see where the fight goes. There's a double taunt and a shockwave coming on to two members. Steven is going to pick up one on the back side of the fight. Server Punk in the middle of three. Obi Toppin trying to get through, gets stunned up, but the Kais is picking up one more kill. Obi Toppin's going to flash into John's. The Q coming through. 
going to be locked up by the last embrace, but Obi Toppin's going to be saying goodbye and picks up a double kill on this Graves. Yeah, that is that is the kills that AQ was looking for. They may have traded that early game dragon, but like we keep saying that that soul point is so far out that at this point, these kills to get this gold lead are going to be so crucial in these future fights. Uh, with that Graves, he is building that Immortal Shield Bow, a very strong item on him when it comes to getting that shield and just the amount of lifesteal and movement that he'll have. Uh, I really like that coming out from AQ there. They immediately called off of going from that Herald because they knew that they either needed to contest that Drake and take it for themselves, or they could pick up some kills there on the side. They definitely picked up some kills. Four to one on the scoreboard. And this game a little bit further apart in the gold standings now. 2,000 up for AQ. Not much, but it's on the right members, right? You talked about the Graves, 2, 0, and 1. All the carries have kills for AQ, and the only kill that went over was to the Vagar, which, again, I guess he is sort of that carry, but probably not the one that you really want those kills going over. I think they wanted that onto the Olaf, uh, because the Vagar stun is going to be very, very immobile, and Oriana does have phase rush, so it's not going to be quite as a movement decrease, but... Again, their bot lane are just prime targets for that unstoppable force coming out of Malphite. Yeah. I definitely agree that the Vagar getting that right now is a little unfortunate. Senna and Vagar, both these scaling champions, we are seeing a play here right now. On to Aredo here from Obutop, and that's going to be the command shockwave coming out from Oriana, and that is going to be a dead play there. But we are seeing pinks coming out from the spot lane here. Not a lime is just going to go through this dragon pit and get out of Dodge City there. I think Northwestern here is kind of getting a little antsy, and they want to make make that catch or make that play that they can here. Just try to make up for that loss that they had there at the dragon. They may have the resource of, you know, that out of combat regen. But they're still behind about 2k gold. And the members of AQ are able to stack up against these lane opponents a lot better now. Yeah, AQ is pulling up a little bit ahead on CS. Surfer Punk is ahead of Fate's Call in this matchup so far. But not too far apart. So not going to be amounting to too much as AQ is going to be setting their sights onto this Rift Herald. Uh, they did have that war controlled out. It's almost down. Steven here just picking up a little bit of extra 10 gold for himself. But from that mid lane play, Shockwave is down. You have that Stand United up, but B-Mamba is on the opposite side of the map here on this Olaf. So AQ is going to be picking up some more gold. But turret plates are going to be going down very, very soon. So they just need to proc this one as soon as possible if they want to get um, those turret plates. Maybe look to the top side as B-Mom is found out by double zero. He's actually just pretty much being bursted down as the Railgum comes through onto double zero. He's stunned up by the cage. That's the interaction we are talking about now. Not a Lime's trying to run out of the Wither. Just being stunned up. That ultimate coming from the Vagar and the Oriana is going to pick up that kill. And AQ is going to pick up first turret of the game. Yeah, we weren't really able to see the top laners there join in. The Unstoppable does stop Shen Ol and the Teleport there. And the... Shen Taunt itself would stop Malphite from joining that fight. So a little unfortunate there for the side of AQ, but they are able to put that Herald top lane and do get more gold onto this Graves, onto this Malphite here. So hopefully they're able to put that gold to good use here, get that front line going and get that side pressure Graves also online, able to stand up against some of these people. Stevenander does have his mythic item completed as well as Boots of Lucidity. He's kind of strong and looking like a big monster right now. Yeah, you can see him not quite edging out in that, that 1v1, but it's kind of to be expected when that Oriana has that shockwave from the phase rush. Can just kind of use those abilities in tandem and just run away after that. So the trade's going back and forth pretty evenly. But it's in the team fight that really shines, because Steve Nair is going to be able to do a lot more over the course of time than the Oriana does. Because the Oriana, like I talked about, just has that shockwave. You have to use that once you try and get in, but there's a lot of ways for AQ to get on top of that Oriana. And that shockwave might not even come out. Now, back to that little river play uh, where, where Double Zero was able to take down that Olaf before being shut down himself. You can already see Double Zero with that Kraken Slayer has those two long swords, building even more crit, more damage here. It's going to be feeling very, very good. That Olaf, again, is behind. With those jungle changes, not going to be quite as strong, not going to be quite as powerful. As now Lime is looking for a play here, Battle Chance is not going to land. But Naredo has to flash away. So it really just seems like AQ is just burning down flashes from the mid lane on cooldown. 
Yeah, looking to be very proactive here. The Mountain Dragon is up right now. PGR able to get a good bit of poke onto B Mambo there as we do see the three members of AQ starting this dragon and PGR making sure that the bot lane still has pressure. Bait Skull is resetting right now, but I do not think Northwestern is going to be able to respond to this. And that is going to be Mountain Dragon going on over to the side of AQ here. And we are seeing Cloud Drake, meaning Cloud Soul, is going to be coming up for this game. There's a few members that are going to be winning pretty big from that, right? You have the Olaf. You have... Even the Vigar is not too bad. You just press R run away, so you might have to use it defensively. But especially the Kaisa, the Rakan, and Swain are going to be huge members with the Cloud Trick if they're able to stack them up. But like last game, we might not even get here as now Obi Toppin is looking onto this Orianna face brush. It does proc here. He's going to be running away. It takes a turret shot for his troubles. But maybe they just want to go for this dive. We have not aligned wrapping around as B-Mama's on the top side, but that wave is already clear. The Flash coming to you, Battle Dance comes through, Killer Instinct as well. Shockwave not going to activate, and Obi Toppin picks up his third kill of the match, and Fate's Call is able to get out on the other side. Yeah, Fate's Call didn't even have to use the Unstoppable, didn't have to use the Flash. That is just going to be the kill picked up for Obi Toppin here, and they are going to be breaking down now, taking every single tier one turret here and they are leading this game by about four and a half k gold aq kind of in the driver's seat this time this graves for obi top is doing so well in this matchup you can see he's getting the counter pick in these games having a little bit more tools to work with and graves with all the with all the jungle changes wasn't affected that bad and one of the worst parts for me at least was that they buffed the the damage and the health on some of these jungle monsters well, guess what? Graves just doesn't interact with jungle camps whatsoever. He just knocks them back over and over again. He's not going to be taking any damage, so his early clear isn't going to be putting him low, and he still clears very, very fast with the new items. So it doesn't feel as bad, and he doesn't have to engage like some of these other champions, right? He can sit back by your back line and just start shredding people as they come through. So Graves, uh, for a lot of people, very uninteractive, very true, but still very, very strong. And Obi Toppin is putting in a good game. Oh, for sure, and we are seeing the Serrated Dirks come out for the side of PJR and Obi Toppin. Uh, most likely going to be going into that collector item. Very, very strong item for when you have these burst-style ADCs and these kind of more assassin-like junglers. Especially since this, I mean, this Olaf has Gore Drinker, but if he's not even able to push the button and gets executed, it's just going to be unfortunate for the side of Northwestern University. Yeah, agreed. And it's not like they're building that much resistances for that, you know, the, the collector coming through. It's going to give that lethality. I mean, you have the steel plated caps, but again, that's not too much. And you have to remember a lot of Olaf's tankiness is, is more of drain tanking, right? You get that Sterix later on. You have the Gore Drinker. You're just trying to heal off, off of your W and, and some of those procs. And so your health pool is all that you're working with. You're not working with those resistances because they get burned away using that Ragnarok as Fate's Call is looking out to Ar Arado, the Killer Instinct comes through, and the kill's gonna go over to not align, but this next turret's gonna go be going down, and Arado is just being picked off by AQ over and over again, and each time they're getting a tower. Yeah, they knew he didn't have that flash, he used it in the past, and they were able to just pick on this flashless Orianna and get these kills and get these mid lane objectives again they're just trying to aim for cracking open this base now as we do have the Baron up in 20 seconds and we have Cloud Drake in 87 seconds here it's gonna be Vagar with Everfrost and Stevenator is getting so much poke damage out onto Vagar does have the Leandri's anguish and that is going to be the Vagar backing off right away AQ they are posturing right now to have a very diverse match here able to see that fates call going top side now and they've been keeping their three other members here in mid lane because nobody can really deal with stevenator swain right now thank you saying you know what game one just a warm-up guys get it out of your system no more intake don't get caught out and they're coming back clean with game two and Talked about that Everfrost for Vagar AC. Well, if you're in range to hit that Everfrost, guess what? You're in range of Death's Hand and never move, and you're going to be chunked out. 14 Baller can't even stand up to Stevenator <laughs> as that Undertow just chips away at Malphite's shield, which doesn't count when moving out as the never move does land onto Aredo. He might be dead here as well as Shockwave and Stan United coming through the Killer Instinct as well. 
And Stevenator is going to be on a killing spree. Takes down that Oriana TP coming out. Last Embrace lands onto Stevenator. He's able to pop him as Double Zero is able to pick up the kill. Unstoppable Force coming onto 14 bubble. Double Zero. Three, one, and seven now on this pick. And B Mamba is the last one left for Northwestern. Very. And that's right before Drake spawns. Yeah, very quick execution there coming from AQ. That was a four kill. 4-1, Stevenator donating his life on over for the rest of his team to successfully take out the other members of Northwestern, and they are going immediately onto this Baron. The only member alive is B Mamba 24 He does have the Flash Smite, but he doesn't have any vision. He has Sweeper, he has two Control Wards, and we'll have to see if he's able to get into this, bit, in the, into this pit, but this Kaisa does so much damage right now to this Baron. Fade Skull trying to spot him out, maybe poke him down. The teleport coming through for Zephyr Punk. He's trying to get into this bit. V-Mama does flash over, takes down, not a line, but they're able to take down the Olaf. Now their eyes are on the Baron. They're going to secure that one. Fade Skull on the other side of the fight. AQ, I just say, they need to dip. Just get out of this fight. Double Zero going to be landed on that Shockwave. And Obi Toppa just on this ward, now going to be on the wrong side of the Rift. He's going to be running right into two members here, and they've just donated this Baron completely away. Now Steven Nader in the middle of four is going to pick off John's on that Senna. He's trying to secure these last three, but is stunned up. W and going away. And AQ, what are you doing, guys? That's a huge shutdown. You just lost all the pressure you had, and now Northwest are going to pick up a Drake as well. Yeah, pretty big throw right there. They just got Baron, but they weren't able to use it at all. Really unfortunate. Little bit of a tilter, if you ask me. Hopefully, AQ is able to knock that one to the side and continue the tempo. But yeah, they are now going to be picking up the third Drake of the game at 22:37. Here, they are still 10 minutes out from getting Soul Point. We'll just have to see if the game can go that far along if they're able to get these next two dragons here. As Northwestern does bite back and try to keep themselves in this game. Yeah, my anger was bleeding through a little bit. Maybe you could tell, but honestly, I was just kind of disappointing on that side and. We gotta call it out when we can, when we can. Now they are ahead, you know, six take gold, so not too bad for AQ. They did just waste a huge buff that could have potentially ended the game. But Northwestern did play that very very well. Good kiting from the Vagar here. Even the Senna doing a great job with that ultimate. Be Mamba able to take down not a lime and playing that fight pretty effectively. So great team fight from Northwestern. Let's see what AQ can do, AQ can do off the back of this. Is Northwestern is going to have a little bit more time to scale up. Yeah, and I want to go back to something you were talking about earlier with this Olaf, how he is a drain tank. His W does give him a steroid for attack speed and does give him a little bit of lifesteal, but Olaf's passive is, is as his health goes down, he actually increases in attack speed. So when you talked about his health being his really only resource, that's kind of that's kind of more true than most people might think. Of course, you see that he has a second resource bar that is mana, but realistically, that's really only used for the undertow. The uh, call the thunder that he does have on his E is a health based resource. So they're kind of really relying on the health of this Olaf. He does have the Gore Drinker now. Did pick up the Phage and the Ruby Crystal, probably looking at Sterix. And we're gonna have to see if this Kaisa, or uh, sorry, this Senna and Orianna can try to help keep him topped off a bit. As we do see a little bit of scuffle here, fighting for vision in the top side. Stevenator is pushing top lane. And we see three members on the bot side here do take tier two turret for AQ. Yep. And you talked about, you know, that Olaf is maybe spotted out here, maybe looking as the target. Is this going to come through Killer Instinct onto B Mamba? He almost just pops. But it's going to go wide for OB Top, and they might be able to pick out the turret on the end of this as B Mamba's kind of their engaged Surfer Punk on the middle of this turret. And now they have the Event Horizon there as well. Everfrost coming through, just clearing that wave. Stevenator, however, is on the top side of the map. Trying to get some damage onto this turret, but they have this completely worded out. They're going to see AQ rotating over and might be trying to make a play off of this. And, you know, with that Olaf, I'd, I'd like to see, you know, an Executioner's Calling coming out from one of these AD carries, right? They're, they're building a lot of damage, but there's so much healing and shielding coming out from the side of Northwestern. You know, the Senna overlapping as Fate Skulls to be stunned up by the Event Horizon. Now the Everfrost, and that's kind of the CC chain. That really annoys me when I see it. I actually faced a rise with Everfrost, and he just... You know, rooted me with his 
empowered W, and then he used Everfrost, and I was just stuck in the same place for like three seconds. One of those annoying things to deal with, and now you can do that with Vagor as well, so... Not glad they're buffing that item in that way, but glad to see it picked up, you know? Yeah, very interesting to always see. I know uh, some people have been taking Everfrost on things like the Silas, able to lock down teams just a little bit more. Uh, we still do have a minute 45 on both objectives here, Dragon and Baron. So we'll kind of have to see how teams are looking to position here right now. I think AQ is going to be a little gun shy after that Baron call that they just had. They're still up that, you know, that 7k gold lead. So I, I, I hope they're not too afraid to try to take a chance here. No, I mean, they could probably just open up, you know, their their inventory, their tab, look at the item spikes. You know, all the members on AQ are sitting at you know, two to three and a half items, whereas Northwestern is really just sitting at two for the most part. Some don't even have a second item complete, so they should realize that they're quite ahead on this tempo. His face goal is going to be going right into the carriage, right into Everfrost, just kited around. And while he can get through with that unstoppable force, that means he needs to engage as well. So AQ should feel comfortable in the fight. As Aredo is actually tagged by the number who has to flash away. Double Zero is being found out by Mamba, but he goes down. Double Zero quickly getting the turn onto that. Now Aredo in the middle of this fight, burning very, very low. Event Horizon not going to land. Neither is the Everfrost's 14 baller is going to be picking up that kill on a Steven here, actually, as he tried to flash over the wall. Now it's a 4v4. For both sides, that turret is not going to go down. To be honest, AQ doesn't really have that great of a siege. They have a siege, they have like dive potential, but all of their damage is very, very short range. They need to get over to these objectives. And if they're using that, maybe to, to get a, a, a pick off, force a fight right by that turret and then move over to the Drake and Baron. I don't see the problem with that, but it just seems like they're getting a little bit too over eager when it comes to these objectives. Yeah, and if you were watching there, it was kind of a misplay coming out from both mid laners there. I believe Aredo thought the ball was still out there, but did waste the ultimate. In fact, only hitting his own teammates there with that command shockwave. And Stevenator there did blow the flash and immediately was exploded by this Vagar. Do use the eye to try to spot out this Baron call. Ooh. That would be four members almost catching out of lime there. Oh, man. Rado so close to landing that. I think if they just waited half a second longer, not a lime. And AQ didn't look like they really had any idea what was going on. They weren't showing on any wards. And maybe they just thought they were resetting as... I think they could have just gotten that pick and maybe ran with it. But again, they're just going to rotate over to the side. The... the command attack does kind of whiff over there now fate's call trudging into the enemy team's jungle feeling pretty comfortable don't think it's gonna be taken down anytime soon with that much armor now building a little bit of magic resistance and we'll have to wait and see where it goes because now we're about 30 you know 28 29 minutes into the game we're hitting that 30 minute mark aq still standing you know 7k gold up against northwestern but don't have much to show for it yeah, AQ hasn't even lost a turret yet. A lot of the gold there coming out. Uh, Northwestern has so much potential for this gold if they're able to catch this. There's the undertow coming out. And the Senna does have the slow, but that cage is not going to hit. We do see uh, assistance been coming out from the side of AQ. They're going to have to be very careful here. Like we said, they are not really a siege comp, but they have the dive potential. There's going to be two members of Northwestern caught out, and now Rado is chunked to half HP. Sinator's now caught in the box. He's going to pop the ultimate and the Zanyas right away, and that is going to be the top lane turret going down. You can see it was just caught in the cage, but Fate Skull walks up to the turret, make sure he's tanking that one so they can take out the turret before they choose to disengage. Now, taking out some of those jungle camps, making sure B-Mama can't find his way back into the game. Level 12 compared to the Graves, level 15, as Surfer Punk's getting pushed around over here. Multiple members just being caught around on this Blast Cone, seeing who wants to go in. Face Call getting very, very low, not alive. Does find a good battle dance onto two members, but it's not the two members you really want to see as Double Zero tagged a member. It's actually stunned up by the cage. Now, not alive is going in. So many members from AQ spread out and getting very, very low. B-Mamba on the other side of this fight is going to be taking down not alive, but he gets taken down instead. And Double Zero is on the back side and is actually taken around as well. So now 3v4 for the side of AQ, Event Horizon. Doing a lot of work in this team fight. Like I said, it's stunning up the Kai'Sa. And Cypherpunk's going to top OB Toppin. Death's... <clears throat> yeah, I think that was... Uh, I think... Just crazy. 
I think that was a bit of a miscommunication there coming from AQ. We did see Fates called there, use the Unstoppable to get out of the fight. Meanwhile, Kaisa PJR did use that Killer Instinct and got into the back line. So I think a little bit of a communication issue coming from the top and bottom here. But it was just a one for two in the end. And they are getting a little bit of vision and counter jungling as much as they can. But it's still a minute 45 on this next Cloud Dragon. And we are currently at 31 minutes. <laughs> no matter which way this goes, we still have about... Eight, seven minutes until the soul point if that's how it will go it could just go three three dragon here and the game might be over but i think both teams are now kind of getting worried about who can pull the trigger faster on this baron especially since aquinas has that kaisa with four items yeah, I mean, the Kais is getting very, very big, but on the other side, the Senna as well has now picked up the Gwensu's Rage Blade, and we talked a bit about that scaling coming up from the Vagar and Senna, and they're starting to chunk Fate's Call here on that Malphite. That true damage coming up from that Clack and Sayer now going to be repeated at a very fast pace if she's able to freely fire over into the side of AQ, so AQ has to be very, very careful in this, and they haven't really picked up any armor shred at this point. I think that's kind of one of the traps of Collector. Personally, not a big fan of that item. Is it, It's actually going to be slowing down some of your builds. I'd rather see a Lord Dominic's early, maybe you know the Mortal Reminder early, getting that healing cut. But as you can see, they're just not doing any damage to Shen, but they're doing a lot of damage to the Senna here. She's almost completely chunked out, has to flash away. Now Obi Toppin is stunned up, but they're not going to go in on him, B-Mamba, on the other side of the map. It's like AQ... It's going to be pulling back for this Baron as Northwestern has to disengage. We'll see if they can fight back. They know that AQ is on the Baron. They're going to want to fight this. Yeah, Steven right now is going to be trying to stop these members here. Did get chunked to half almost immediately. It's going to be Vagar Cage popping up. And that's going to be Command Shockwave. Does take out two members of AQ here. We have Fates Call on the back line. Obi Toppin trying his best. Same night going on to Senna. Fates Call very, very low. Does get dropped by Oredo. Obi Toppin here does crit and deal so much damage to these members. He is trying to kite back against Server Punk as much as he can. That's going to be the taunt landed, and that is going to be four for four. Very, very long fight there. Double zero, able to pick up two on the back end of the fight. Uses the Killer Instinct right before the cage goes down. Is able to take out two members. The Vagar was quick to follow. Everyone doing very, very low. But you can see how long it takes AQ to shred. Some of these big tanks like like in Mamba when he has the team back up like that Shen. And that Stand United was coming in clutch there for a while. Allowed them to stay in the fight much, much longer. But AQ is going to be put on soul point. They do take that Cloud Drake. As Surfer Punk decided to go back into the base, as just about a few taps from the Kaisa would take him down with that collector. So, not too bad right there. Still, it's neck and neck in these team fights, and the gold really has stagnated. It's not getting much more, you know, than than the the seven eight K. But honestly, Northwestern's not in a bad spot because some of their 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 scaling is built on the levels and and how far the game goes in, not specifically on items and. It was a little strange there, I'd say, that fight. Maybe they wanted to, to go in and out. But honestly, I think Aredo just had a perfect shockwave with the event horizon coming from 14 Baller. They were able to find out two members, Steven Nader and Not Align, when they tried to engage. And that kind of put them ahead in that team fight early. But some good mechanics brought AQ in later. Yeah, we are getting to the point in the game where <clears throat> no matter your gold lead, <laughs> there's a certain point where time is what takes over. You could have that, you know, 5 to 10k gold lead, but that doesn't matter when almost everybody is on that, you know, 4 or 5 item end game build path here. And we are getting closer and closer to those numbers. We are seeing AQ. They are still ahead of their counterparts with these items. But again, as the game continues, that gold lead will mean less and less, which could cause some frustration here for AQ since, like Blue Jay said, it's kind of just been stagnant. There really hasn't been a, a crazy shift or increase or decrease. It's not like one side's winning heavily in, in most... Excuse me, most of these fights, except for kind of that Baron throw there earlier on. But, it's just going to be a little bit of a Baron dance. Everyone kind of wants to go to this objective. They can't, as we saw before, can't really siege very well. So, AQ really needs to force um, Northwestern's hand at this objective. Double zero and Surfer Pump kind of doing it out. Double zero here, not going out to the Baron. So, I don't think Northwestern's too worried they can get the drop on some of these positions. Because they know that 
Kaisa really has to be there to shred that Drake. And Obi Top and Steven are actually down to, to have health from all that chunk coming out from Aredo's command attack. Yeah, Steven here especially going to have to be very careful. Does have the Zanya. Zan Lime does get hit by the command move there. And now we see the five man squad coming out. There's going to be Nata Lime having to use the flash there. Fate's call kind of walking in on his own there. Does have the Olaf hitting the undertow, getting the slow as much as they can. The Orianna with the command dissonance. That is going to be not a line. I'm trying to say as much as he can there. But we are seeing a mid lane play coming out from PJR. And he does take Ooh. out two members on his own on the other side. Stevenator does come to help as much as he can here. We are seeing the TP come out from Orianna here. Shen is going to be getting out of here alive. Stevenator taking a lot of damage here from this Orianna. That's going to be the mid lane inhibitor dropping. Obi Toppin does run in, has the red smite. Olaf did pop the Ragnarok, and we're going to see the never move does miss. Stair Gauge being popped, but that's going to be Obi Toppin picking up the kill. Never move missing once again. That's going to be the smoke screen hitting Orianna here. Oh, very close there, and that is going to be Shen picking up the shutdown from the graves there, and Stevenator is going to have to walk away from this. Does get the never move? It's going to be the Eye of the Empire there landing. He's poking out the Shen quite well, but Orianna is standing here. Aredo ready to defend with Surfer Punk. Does get the hand once again. That's going to be the Command Shockwave. Both members here at a quarter health. That is going to be the Flash coming out of Stevenator. Flash coming out of Aredo, and that is going to be the Zanyas, oh. and the Palpatine Shock Hand does clean up the kill there. The last embrace just gets chunked by the minion, so Jans isn't able to clean that one up. But the whole time that Aredo and B Mamba were chasing Fate's Call and not a lime onto all the way across the map, Double Zero was just chunking into that inhibitor. You had OV top and pushing down that bot side, and they're able to take that one out. So trying to play some of that macro game, and that might be what it takes. They're trying to get those small advantages, make sure they can lock someone down into that mid lane with that inhibitor being down. So they're going to be getting that push. The Cloud Drake is spawning in 45 seconds, so this could be another fight that they can force out and maybe take the win from there. But it has to be kind of clean. It's not going to be where one person can kind of, you know, just be the last one standing, 1v1, because that's not going to how you're going to you're gonna be able to win the game. You're going to need at least two to three members either pushing down into that mid lane with those super minions, even down to the bot side or top side, right? They only have one turret left, but if they can get that Baron buff as well, that could be an easy secure. Yeah, thing about that last fight as well there, there were some crucial uh, summoner spells used. Aredo and Surfer Punk's flashes are down. Stevenator both sums down as well as Not a Lime's flash. They are getting some poke now on to the uh, members of Northwestern University here, trying to zone as much as they can. We are seeing Obi Top, and he's actually in the Baron Pit right now. And I think they're going to try to make a sneaky play here. Kaisa and Graves do a lot of damage, and I don't think Northwestern is actually expecting this play to come out from AQ. No, and I love this a lot, because honestly, this Cloud Soul doesn't matter whatsoever. It's just trying to force people to fight, right? Baron is going to be the bigger chunk. They can't siege. They need that Baron buff. And I say just give this one up. You guys don't need to fight here. Maybe they could just, if they just keep them over here, stop them from backing, getting a few picks onto Aredo is a good shock. He's going to land two members. Surfer Punk. Actually has to use the stand unite as well, so he's gonna be stopped as well. Fate Skull is gonna claim that one. And double zero and Obi Toppin are kinda of looking to finish the game, but the teleport does come through for Surfer Punk. That bonus movement speed almost catches him out, but Obi Toppin's gonna to be taking down that top lane inhibitor while the bot lane pushes as well. So AQ should be able to finish off this one. Yeah, very clever play coming out from AQ right there. They knew that they were gonna have a contested soul point. They played behind the vision line it played out of northwestern's vision itself and they were able to sneak the baron with just two members of aq and now they are sieging with these baron empowered minions here and they're going to be having many waves here and super minions coming through mid lane super minions coming through bot and top as well as we now have the two sets per wave aq is knocking on the doors of this game too ready to close it out and that's gonna be not a lime does get poked out and murdered by jans right there but that is going to be the first turret going down that's gonna be unstoppable going on to vagar he does pull the flash there b mamba 24 does drop there that's gonna be the shockwave coming out from 
Oriana, and there's just so much going on right now in this fight. Obi Toppin trying to stop Surfer Punk. Aredo is on the backside of this fight, and he's actually going to clean up Obi Toppin. And right now, we are at three for four. AQ going to have to pull back. It's just Fate's call left, but the base is in shambles for Northwestern University. I was about to say, Oredo was coming up in a few seconds as they find that pick onto this Recon. Can't use the quickness, can't use the grand entrance into this battle dance to navigate that fight as he's just locked down. Killed instantly, and Northwestern are just barely holding on, but AQ isn't able to find the win that they need. I, they could probably find it very, very soon. Like you said, like they got all those inhibitors pretty close to the same time those baron i mean the the super minions are gonna be coming into the base wave after wave and if they can kind of just split up the fight just get one person to just tap that tower it should be going down very very easily as the rest of the members still coming up for the side of aq but everyone is up for northwestern so they kind of just need to back out and around yeah, now the rest of the members of AQ are spawning. The mid lane inhibitor is back up. Next objective on the map is going to be that Cloud Drake. It is soul point for both teams as we are at 41 minutes and 35 seconds. Very long game coming out here right now. AQ picking up the buffs that they can and dropping the vision deep into jungle as they do have super minions still marching in top and bot side. And earlier you were talking, well, we were talking about the scaling factor. You said time is, is really kind of the key component here. And it's really starting to show as, as multiple members are pretty much full build, right? You have the that Swain coming through. You have the Kaisa full build, Oriana pretty much as well. Even the Senna is feeling at a very comfortable spot. You don't need much more than this to really start off and, and start burning some of these fights. And if we look a little bit at the stack, she's at 160 souls. And the Vagar is only a 283 ability power. So honestly, Vagar stacking not as much as I would have expected. Typically, I can see, you know, 500 uh, stacks, something crazy at this point of the game. So AQ doing actually a pretty good job of managing that as Event Horizon goes down. Nevermove was actually found onto the Oriana. B Mama pops the Ragnarok, but he has to split up into these fight. Johns and B Mama trying to go all in. Double zero getting multiple shields. Event Horizon goes down. Not a lime taken out at the first. Double zero is soon to follow. Shockwave onto Aredo. Stan United giving him such a huge shield. Now Fates calls in the back line. Obi Top is punted. But the three members are standing strong for the side of AQ. If Fate's Goal is going to take down the Olaf now, a 3v3 for AQ forces Northwestern. The Navy move is going to find the Shen. Eye of the Empire is not going to land us the 14 baller, but they're going to be looking for the end. They have three waves crashing into this turret. They just need to hit this turret. Don't go for the fight. It's the last of Embrace does land. He's locked up, and the taunt is going to be flashed onto Ob Taunt. He's trying to get away. Actually, does take down Johns in the middle of this fight. The 14 baller just going to use his ultimate and pop him like a balloon. Now, Fate's call has his full health up. He might just be able to end this here. As uh, never mind, all that AP damage is coming in clutch. Does take down that final turret. Unstoppable force coming into that Shen. Going to taunt. Does not connect. That is an open nexus for the side of Northwestern. And this Elder Drake is coming up in 10... Well, not the Elder Drake. My goodness, we're at... We're still Drake's at soul this point at 43 minutes. <sighs> oh, man. That's going to be a soul point. Maybe they can force is... a fight. It's it's going to be okay. It's not that big of a deal, to be honest. But it has been just something to pick up while they're waiting. Such a long game back and forth. But Northwestern still doesn't even have a turret taking down... They are trying to stay in this game, and they have staved off death for 44 minutes, and their last hope is to try to keep Oredo alive and hope that they can get this Baron and get some objectives on the map so that distance between them and winning this game is a lot shorter. They still have so many turrets to get through. It is a long journey for the side of Northwestern, but they're staving off the assault of Aquinas College here. So far, 45 minutes into this game, Devil's Hero going to pick up that red buff. That's a little small win. Is Now the Baron is up here, but they have to be careful because Fate Skull does have teleport, but it is just the tank who has teleport, so it's only they can do a little split push and end the game. But still, have super minions into the mid lane. Looks like AQ is going to be trying to go for a play. Surfer Punk 
now has a little bit of a wraith here. It's gonna be found out. The cage coming through. Fate Skull does find a raid on the back line. B Mamba is in the middle of the fight, but he instantly goes down this late into the game as AQ is gonna be chasing in with an excellent event. Horizon and Shockwave is gonna find two members. A double kill going over to the baller. But in the end, Surfer Punk goes down as well. And that's your big tank. I'm not sure if the other three members have what it takes to stand up to the side of AQ. If they just get tagged by Nevermove, that could be it. As the Baron is getting shredded very, very quickly. If they don't have a jungle to contest, Obi Top is going to take that one. And maybe he'll be taking the game off of this push. Yeah, three versus three right now. AQ has the Baron empowered minions to push down the turretless base of Northwestern University here. We do see Stevenator and PGR starting to follow slowly behind Obi Top and trying to get these side waves back into the base. They need to knock down these inhibitors. They have to be so careful with how strong Rado and the 14 baller are. They're just able to explode any members they catch. Slow and steady is the name of the game for pretty much both these squads. As we're approaching a very long game here, but I like this move from AQ. Just take a reset. You have your mid lane inhibitor down. It's an open nexus. Just take down inhibitor. Play it slow. Wait for those minions to overwhelm the opposition and then take your win. The worst thing they could do right now is trying to go for a half hazard engage, throwing a few members into the fight and getting take taken out before you take down an inhibitor. Because while they do have to burn down, you know, one, two, three, four, five towers if they just go down one lane, it's still very possible. As these respawn timers are so long, and towers will be shredded so easily from the likes of Aredo, from Jonza, and even the baller can be popping these things. Yeah, for sure. <clears throat> We're getting into that territory now, especially with these level 18s and how far we've gotten to this game. These respawn timers can go past a, an, an entire minute. And if given the opportunity, like you were saying, with the 14 baller and Aredo, they are able to deal so much damage to objectives, especially with these minions around. You know, the AP skin and turret damage, and we are seeing the Ragnarok proc followed by the Sand United. It does flash into the middle of the team here, and that is going to be not a line being dropped by Surfer Punk. And that is actually going to be a missed command shockwave here, and that is just going to be kills picked up for the side of AQ as the four surviving members go in to finish off this best of three series against Northwestern University. Oh, they tried to make the stand there at the very end, but... B Mamba and Surfer Punk just gets taken down right before that shockwave comes through. And that's just a what if situation. What if that shockwave goes down onto all members of AQ? That could have just been the game for them. But in the end, AQ is able to take down Northwestern, now finishing their sea little run. As if in, in the end, so they're not going to be moving into playoffs, but we are registered into the Teemo Cup. So we will still be streaming our Saturday games. Yep, and everybody, thank you again for watching. Again, this was a 2-0 series in favor of Aquinas against Northwestern University. Blue Jay, send us off. It's been a great day. Like you said, it's been sunny and shining over here in Michigan, and we're going to take the win for both sides and both games for AQ. Congratulations to both players. We'll see you all soon. Keep us updated. Follow us over on Twitter at AQ Esports or Aquinas Esports for all of our updates. We play Rocket League, we play Smash Bros, and of course we play some more League of Legends. So we'll see you guys soon. Good night, everybody.